If you have your Bible tonight, turn to the book of Revelation chapter 18. And uh, we are going to look tonight as a starting place at verse 10. So Revelation 18 and verse 10. While you're turning there, I'll tell you where we're at in this study uh, entitled Babylon Has Fallen. We have talked about three things so far, or four things. We've talked about Babylon and how that judgment was pronounced in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 18. And then we talked about judgment avoid in uh, Revelation chapter 18, avoided uh, Revelation chapter 18 verses 4 and 5. And then we talked about judgment defined, thirdly, in Revelation chapter 18 verses 6 through 8. And we talked about one more thing. We talked about, fourthly, judgment cries. But tonight, we are going to talk about judgment woes in this study. Uh, Babylon has fallen, and uh, we're going to take it from verse 10. Let's all stand tonight, and we'll read together out of verse 10 and talking on this subject of Babylon has fallen and judgment woes. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Let's thank the Lord for the reading of his word. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for your precious word. We ask tonight, Father, that you will bless us with your presence. Thank you for allowing us tonight to come into your house and study together. And Lord, I just pray that you'll give us something tonight. Holy Spirit, speak to our heart. Help those of us that know you and know you in the free pardon of sin tonight that we can be that witness that you would have us to be. Lord, help us to never forget how good you've been to us to teach us and to nourish us and to feed us and Lord that uh, when we receive from you much is required and I pray tonight Father that you'll help us to understand your word and thank you for what you're going to do for us here in your house thank you for allowing us to come to your house tonight thank you that we're well enough to be able to get here in your precious name we pray these things in the name of Jesus and all God's people said now go tell somebody you love them tonight. Okay. So TJ is really fast. He's got your sign-up sheet out there for the picnic up at uh, Brian and Ann's house. So... Um, if you can bring a couple of things like, you know, dessert and salads and, uh, you know, beans, anything that goes with hamburgers and hot dogs, potato salad, slaw, we like it all, don't we? We'll, we'll just eat everything you bring, so just bring it. And uh, then we'll get chips and we'll get the drinks and the hamburgers and the hot dogs. And uh, so we'll be set. I appreciate Brian and Ann having us back up there again. I love going up there. It's a beautiful view up there. If you've never been up there, you need to go and uh, just be able to see the view that's up there. Well, there you go. So you'll be able to see to uh, Knoxville now. <laughs> well, you know, um, as we study tonight, and I, I want to kind of go slow because I think that this is important to understand these things that are going on now. We're kind of um, looking back a little bit at uh, Babylon here and talking about Babylon. And uh, last week we really got into the destruction of Babylon. And uh, so as I read this verse tonight, verse 10, it is a picture of the people of the world standing back from the destruction, the judgment of Babylon, and looking at this mighty city and being in fear. 
It's a place that we look at tonight after this destruction of Babylon that uh, these people are careful to keep their distance from this stricken city. And you say, well, why? Because for one thing, they're powerless to help. Because how many of you know God is all-powerful? And when God does something, he does it right. And no man can change it when God does it. So they're very smart to know that they're powerless to help the situation there. And uh, their fear is that if they get involved, that her torment will be put upon them, but actually it's going to happen to them anyway. And by the way, folks, I want you to remember this and keep this in mind as we talk about Babylon here. And we'll probably get out of this and go in to another message tonight. But as we're talking about Babylon here, I want you to keep in mind that Babylon is an actual city of this time. Now, when I say that, it's not just a symbol for the world system or the entire world. It's an actual city. And um, the entire world, of course, is not destroyed at this time. They're still moving. They're still alive. They're still doing things. This is just judgment upon the actual city of Babylon. And when you think of that, it's a precursor to the doom that's going to fall upon the entire world. It's going to happen. And I hope if you know people that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you are telling them about the things that you're studying on Wednesday night in the book of Babylon, or in the book of Revelation, because Babylon is one of those things that might catch their interest to know that this is going to happen one day. And as the world stands there, as this world stands back and watches Babylon burn, the leaders start to cry out in anguish in verse 10, and they say, Alas, alas, the great city of Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. This is the crown jewel of this world at this time. This city is the crown jewel of the Antichrist and his empire. It's a great city, Babylon. It's great because of its wealth and because of its notoriety in all of the world. And uh, it has survived uh, certain devastating things that have taken place during this last part of Uh, of the book of Revelation, this last part of tribulation, uh, this city has survived certain devastation that the world has seen and that people have seen that has happened to the world. It has survived so far. But it doesn't survive when the Lord comes down. It doesn't survive when His judgment comes down. Because, folks, God said, because of their uh, commitment to wickedness, and their commitment to, to all of the things that were going on, the Antichrist and the false prophet and, and, and the devil himself, because of their wickedness, God destroyed them. And the world believed that this was a city that could not be destroyed. So as they stood back and seen the devastation of Babylon, they thought to themselves, well, if that city can be destroyed, then everything will be destroyed. And by the way, they would be right because it's going to be destroyed. Now, since um, they have surveyed the devastation now of what has happened to Babylon and the judgment of God and the tribulation up to that point, the believers or the people of that world at that time will start believing that something big is going to happen and they're probably not going to survive this. Especially after the swift destruction in one hour. I don't know if that's a literal hour, but it's fast is what it means. It's swift. When God speaks, it happens. And that's what it's talking about here. And it shocks and amazes them that something this big, you know, 
It's just like when the Titanic went down, you know, people were saying it's unsinkable. You can't sink this ship. Well, that's kind of what the world thinks of this time uh, of Babylon. You, you can't destroy this place. You can't get rid of this place because of its influence and because of its power. But the Bible says in one hour, God does away with it. And so the whole world stands back and they're shocked and they're amazed at what has happened. They cry out in dismay. And they say things like, for one in one hour, your judgment has come. The judgment of Babylon will happen in a, happen in a rapid way, just as verse 8 predicted. But let's look at the people now who mourned over this city. Let, let, let's figure out who it was that was mourning because I think a lot of times we just stand back and say, well, it was the whole world, but God puts them into categories, and I want you to listen who mourned the most. Well, first of all, the first group we find in verse 11. And the Bible says there that the first group that mourn the judgment and the devastation of Babylon and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. You see, the destruction of the Antichrist and his capital will end in a, 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 end in a resemblance that's not normal that anybody has really seen happen in that short of time to a great city like this. And the reason I say that is because of the merchants that, that sell their goods and give their goods and buy and sell through this, uh, their ec economic activity at this time that is here on this earth. In just a short time, everything will be gone. It will be difficulty like never before, brought on by divine judgment of God upon this earth. It would be like the stock market crash that has never been seen before on this earth, that everything is gone. And all of these merchants were crying and weeping and mourning over what has happened to Babylon. Listen to the things that were these merchants were involved in. The following is a list of 28 items that, and categories of merchandise that, that comprise the merchant's cargoes of that time. Listen to verses 12 and 13. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and thine wood and all manner uh, uh, vessels of ivory and, and all manner vessels of uh, most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and souls of men. This is what the merchants deal, dealt with, and now it's gone. It's all gone. They, they, they have this merchandise anymore. And by the way, these items, as he is telling us these, are common uh, commodities in this time. So it was things that John knew that he wrote about, but it was common commodities in this ancient world. It was a source. These things that I just read you about, these things that I told you about were a source of immense wealth during this time. Now, what will it be during the time of tribulation? I don't know. I'm sure gold and all this will be part of it, money and all this will be part of it, but... It, 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 he's just telling us that everything that they sold, these merchants, uh, it was a commodities for them to make immense financial gain. And it's gone. It's all gone. This commercial empire, Babylon, uh, this place of the Antichrist and his, his, his uh, you know, false prophet and his people is gone. They continue, they continue their uh, lament. The merchants now address Babylon directly in verse 14. Here's what they say about that. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are, are departed from thee. And, and all things which were dainty and, and goodly are departed from thee. And thou shalt find them, read that with me, no more what? No more at all. They're nowhere on the earth to be found. 
Everything was shipped there and everything was shipped out of there. Everything went through the Antichrist and went through his political uh, you know, machine. And now within one moment in time, it's all gone. God wipes it all out. They have it no more. They will be wealthy no more. They will have no money anymore. Materialism, wealth has passed away. And man can no longer find them anymore. They're gone forever. They're bankrupt. God bankrupts the system of this world forever during this time that he takes down Babylon. The second thing I want you to notice, not only do we see the ones who sell the goods, but we see the one who owns the goods, the leaders of this empire. Listen to their response in verses 15 through 17. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. And saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches is come to naught. So they weep and mourn. They're really emotional. There's no sympathy for them because their city has been decimated and, and it's collapsed. It's been stripped. It's gone. And all their financial resources are gone. Nevermore. It's not like uh, if there's a collapse, you know, the stock market, uh, sooner or later it, it comes back up or it goes back up. That's not what, what's going to happen during this time. When it's gone, it's gone for good. Never more to return. And everything's gone. And they sit and look and mourn over this. And you want to know why? Because they put their whole heart and soul into materialism and material things. And folks, that's where the world is tonight. Most of the world has put their whole heart, soul, everything they are into materialism. To what they can get and what they can gain. And don't we all know that it can be gone that fast? Overnight, in one hour, it can all be gone. And that's exactly what's happened here. These merchants, they lament over the materialistic passions of their soul. And, and this materialistic passion can no longer be fulfilled because there's nothing to fulfill it. They start to weep and mourn. Not only will they weep now, but listen folks, these people are lost without Jesus. They'll weep and mourn for eternity in hell forevermore. But not only that, these greedy merchants are the classic illustration of all those who gain the whole world but lose their own soul. And we have many of those in our day and time, don't we? They gain everything maybe this world has for them, but their soul, they're lost. They don't know Jesus. And, and maybe it's you that can get to them and tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe it's you that can win them to the Lord. The third group that we see that mourn over Babylon's destruction is found in verse 17. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. Now, I know what you're thinking. You know, well, the sea, you know, but we, remember, we're going back a little bit. God is showing us back a little bit. So some of the oceans are still open right now. You know, not all of them, this, and this plague has not ruined all the oceans. So some of the ships can still sail. So... We see here, and every shipmaster and all the companies in the ships and sailors and all as many trade by sea stood afar off. Because what I'm trying to tell you is Babylon becomes the port of entry for the whole world. It becomes the place where all goods are shipped and all goods are brought to. It's that way because the devil wants to keep up and, and the Antichrist wants to keep up with his stuff. He don't trust just anybody. And it, all that will eat will have 
And all that will have any food at that time will be the ones that take the mark of the beast anyway. Because if these people have the mark of Jesus Christ on them, they will not eat. They will not get any goods. So everything is controlled by the Antichrist. Everything's coming through there and going out of there. And in addition to Babylon's political and economic importance, Babylon will also be an important distribution center during this time. But with its destruction, there will be no more goods. Nothing will be transported. Nothing will go out and nothing will go in. And like the rulers and the merchants, the sailors were careful to stand at a safe distance from this place. They gazed at it. They looked at it. And, and you say, well, how did they look at it? How did they gaze at it? Well, CNN and all of these uh, news broadcasts will broadcast all of this. It'll be all over the world. People will be able to see what's going on during that time. Do you believe that? Yeah. They'll know. And they stand back. And they look at this destruction of their job, of everything that they knew that was good for them. It's gone now. All these sailors, all of these ship merchants, and all of these, they stand at a safe distance because they know this city is ruined. And the Bible says they were crying out in verse 18, and they were crying out, what city is like unto this great city? In other words, what they were saying, this will never come about again. We will never make money like this again. Look at verse 19. And they cast dust on their heads. Listen to this. And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich, all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is made desolate. They put dust on their head. Do you ever remember in the Old Testament putting dust on their head and setting it in sackcloth and ashes? That, that usually happened after somebody died. That's the way they mourned a death. In other words, these people, these merchants, these buyers, uh, uh, these uh, uh, people that were on ships and that was their livelihood, they mourned for this city like somebody died. Like it was their, their, their wives or their sons or their daughters. They, they, they mourned and put dust on their heads. And, and it's an expression of grief. It's an expression of suffering. It's an expression of pain. But it's not an expression of repentance. They did not repent. These sailors did not mourn over their sins at all. The merchants never mourned over their sins. The buyers never mourned over their sins. All they mourned about was loss of business. And loss of money and loss of goods, loss of gold and silver, precious stones. That's what they mourned over. They didn't mourn because they didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They mourned because they lost their stuff. And that's exactly the way the world is going tonight, folks. We don't mourn over lost souls anymore. We mourn because we've lost our stuff. The sixth thing is judgment enjoyed. Look at Revelation 18, 20. The Bible says there, And rejoiced over her, thou heaven, and ye holy angels and prophets, for God hath avenged you on earth. What is happening here on earth is a, a mourning, a, a death a funeral service is going on on earth. But you know what's going on in heaven? A heavenly Hallelujah. And by the way, we'll be part of that. Amen? Because we're going out of here in the rapture of the church. We're not going to be here during this last part of tribulation. We're not going to be here during this tribulation. We're going to be in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you, the Bible says in heaven, ye holy apostles and prophets, God had avenged you on her. In other words, they have a, a quite different perspective on Babylon's judgment. They, they're happy because of it. 
Heaven's happy because God has judged the great whore. Because God has got rid of it. And because God has put the Antichrist in his place. And the false prophet in his place. And the devil in his place. Heaven rejoices. Now they're not rejoicing over the damnation of sinners. We never do that. Even in heaven they don't do that. They're not rejoicing because men died during that judgment of that great city and went to hell. Women died and went to hell. Uh, uh, they're, not, they're not happy over that. But because they have triumphed and God has triumphed in righteousness. How many of you know righteousness one day will overcome this old sin, uh, wicked world? How many understand that? One of these days in heaven, you, you might remember this, us talking about this tonight, that when this happens to Babylon, one of these days, uh, there's going to be heavenly hallelujahs in heaven when God does this to Babylon. We're going to praise Him and worship Him because He's revenged and, and He has judged uh, the wickedness of this earth. What a wonderful time they are having because of the triumph of righteousness of God's judgment upon this earth they exalt Jesus Christ and that's what they're doing in heaven they're exalting him because he has eliminated his enemies in Babylon they are exalting him because they know that his kingdom is getting ready to be set up here on this earth and how many of you know that one of these days there'll be a new heaven and a new earth and it'll be better than it was during the Garden of Eden. I believe that, don't you? I believe that. And they're celebrating that. You want to know why? Because they know that. Because they've read their Bible. They know what God is going to do. They know the end. And by the way, we know the end, don't we? We know what's going to happen. <coughs> we know how God is going to judge this old wicked world. And we know that one day we're going to rule and we're going to reign with Him as saved individuals. The seventh thing is judgment completed. Now look in verses 21 through 23. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of the harpers and the musicians and the pipers and the trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. No craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of the millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. What does that mean? Well, kindly get the picture of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the <laughs> these movies that are on TV. I kind of get this picture when I see that. Uh, this great city, I mean, a city like New York City, even greater than New York City, even greater than, you know, uh, all these big cities. And here it is, it's desolate. There's nothing there. Everything's gone. That's what he's saying there. You say, well, how do you get that picture uh, from that verse that you just read? Well, another strong angel now appears in the vision, and in a dramatic act, he pictures Babylon's destruction here. He says, in one moment of time, as the stone disappeared into the sea, Babylon will disappear. One moment. When God speaks it, in one moment, it disappears forever. Jeremiah talked about this and uh, talked about a similar destruction. Listen to Jeremiah 51, 61 through 64. And Jeremiah said to Sierra, when thou comest to Babylon and shalt see, 
and shalt read all these words. Then shalt thou say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place to cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but it shall be desolate forever. And it shall be when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone uh, to it and cast it into the midst of the Euphrates. And thou shalt say, Thus saith Babylon, Sink, and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. What he's talking about is completion. So complete will Babylon be destructed that he mentions things that are usually in a city that are not there anymore. Did you notice what he said? First of all, he says, in this city, never again, ever again will there be any music at all. Listen, verse 22. And the voice of the harpers and the musicians and of the pipers and trumpeters, read that with me, shall be heard, what? No more at all in thee. Never again. It's done. It's finished. Then he says something else there. You say, why is that important? Because God thought it was important to tell you that. He wants you to know how desolate and how he dis destruction came upon that city and he destroyed it because of its wickedness. There will be no more working there. Look at verse 22. And no more craftsmen of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. No more work. No more building. No more building big buildings. No more building big skyscrapers. No more roads being built. Nothing being built because it's gone. And he says there'll be no more preparing food there in this city. Verse 22. And the sound of the millstone shall be heard no more at all. And you know what the millstone represented? The flour, the cooking. No more cooking in this city. The city will be completely abandoned, verse 23. This is scary. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. I don't know how many millions of people will be in this city at that time when God completely destructs it, destroys it. But the Bible says not one thing will be alive in this city. Nothing. Everything's gone. Now think about that just for a moment. These people are standing back all over the world. This is their centerpiece. This is where they made all their money. This is their pride and joy. And in one hour, God says it's gone. No life. Nothing moving. No cars. <laughs> no airplanes going in and out. No ships going in and out. In one hour, in one moment of time, it's gone. And the world is standing back and looking. And there's no more light in it. There's no more life. The animals are dead. The people are dead. Everything's dead. And then the last thing. And this is sad. Verse 23, no more falling in love. Because the Bible says the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride. Read that with me, shall what? No more weddings. No more celebrations. Everything's dead. Thoroughly destroyed. Never to rise again. I'm going to start this tonight, but we won't get far. But I knew that I would get through with the message, so I started on the other message. And I entitled in this one, Heavenly Hallelujahs, and I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 19. And I want you to look with me at verses 1 through 3. Verses 1 through 3 out of Revelation 19. And it says, and after these things, I heard a great voice. After what things? After the destruction of Babylon. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people 
in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah. And her smoke rose up forever and forever. So now as we approach this scene, and this has been a long awaited time to approach this, Revelation now shifts. It goes from earth to now we're in heaven. All right, we're not on earth anymore, we're in heaven. And now chapter 6 to now, as it shifts from this earth where it has been since chapter 6, it now goes to heaven, as I said, and we are seeing the intervening chapters have shown us God's explosion when it comes to judgment upon this earth. We've talked about that from chapter 6. All the vows, all the bowl judgments, all these things that have happened. But the particular target of God's wrath was on Babylon, as we just talked about. Because it was where the Antichrist was running his worldwide um, religious system, his political system, his economic empire, the wickedness of the world was there. And it was symbolized by its capital city, as I've just told you, Babylon. But now that Babylon destruction was described in detail, we see that in chapter 17 and 18, how that he showed us Babylon's destruction in detail. That destruction which caused many upon the earth, as we just talked about tonight, to be in dismay. But even though the earth was in dismay, as I told you, it brings joy to heaven. Because it is the devastation of the world's, you know, capital city and the Antichrist. And it was a fatal blow to wickedness and judgment upon this earth. It was a final destruction. It took out some of the world's forces that were in charge at that time and in power. But right after this, right after this, comes the Battle of Armageddon. And in the battle of Armageddon, listen to me, it'll just be a moment of time too. In one second of time, God will wrap things up. You say, how does he do that? Because he's all powerful. Just in one second of time, he will step on this earth and wrap things up, the trumpet, and he will wrap it up. It'll be done with. It'll be the final destruction of all the world forces. And then... After this, of course, the sinners will be put into hell forever. Those that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have to understand that God has gave them every opportunity. How many understand that? To repent. Time and time again, He has given them every opportunity to repent. From the 144,000 to the two witnesses, to the angels. I mean, he's gave them every opportunity to give their heart and life to him. But despite all that, and despite the, the judgment on Babylon, despite standing back and seeing the power of God, they still do not repent. They're still lost, unrepented towards God. And as heaven here, as we're reading tonight, is rejoicing. Uh, listen, they're rejoicing. They're, they're not rejoicing over the damnation, as I said, of those that reject God. But they're rejoicing because they know this thing's getting ready to wrap up. We know this thing is getting ready to wrap up. And God's going to be properly honored one day. How many are ready for that? I'm tired of the way they talk about my God tonight. I'm tired of the way they put him down, aren't you? I'm tired of the way they say they are many gods and that he's not 
the only God. You know, he's, there's many. And I'm here to tell you, one of these days, he's going to show them. And we're going to be right there with him. Aren't you glad about that? We're going to be right there with him. So tonight, just for a second, I want to give you a few reasons that heaven has joy during this time. The first reason is found there in verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Now remember, this new vision takes place after the destruction of Babylon. It takes place before the triumphal entry of Jesus and before the battle of Armageddon. But I'm here to tell you, one of these days after the battle of Armageddon, and we see all of these things come to pass, he's going to establish his millennial kingdom. How many understand that? And as the Lord cries over, as all of these people cry over uh, Babylon's destruction, it fades to silence now. All that's gone. Because all we hear now in these verses is the hallelujahs of heaven. The rejoicing of heaven because of what God has done to Babylon. Listen uh, to verse 1 again. And the great voice of much people in heaven saying, hallelujah. You better practice up on that word. Because I'm telling you, that's probably you're going to be saying it a lot when we get to heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. Go ahead and say it. Yeah, see, you're pretty good at it. But one of these days, you're going to get a lot better. (laughs) Now, right here, the text doesn't really identify those whose voices make up this great voice as, as John is telling us about, as John heard. But I'm thinking that likely it is some it's angels that are saying hallelujah. It's uh, all the apostles that are saying hallelujah. But it's also the church that's saying hallelujah. We're worshiping God. By the way, folks, we'll be doing a lot of that when we get to heaven. Amen. We'll be able to worship Him anytime, all the time. We'll just bow down at His feet and worship Him. Won't that be good? How many of you waiting tonight just to see him face to face? I can't wait to see him, can you? I mean, I, I, I've served him all these years now. I've never seen him face to face. But one of these days when I get to heaven and I can handle being around his glory. Because right now you can't handle being around his glory. You just fall apart. Amen. Amen. But one of these days when we get to heaven, we'll we'll be able to handle being around His glory. And we'll just take our time, as Kathy sings that song, take our time around His throne and at His feet. And and, and we'll just get to see Him all the time. Won't that be great? The one you've served all these years, you're going to be able to see Him. But at this moment in time, John says, we're saying hallelujah. We're lifting Him up. We're worshiping Him. Uh, There's a Greek word, and it translates like this. Hallel means to praise, and Yah means God. So that means to praise God. That's what hallelujah means. It means that we're going to bow down and worship Him and praise Him. And we're worshiping right here because salvation has really not come in our lives because we know we're saved tonight, amen? We know we're going to heaven because we're saved. But what I want to show you here is because salvation has come for God's people. Now, when you say that, what do you mean, preacher? Well, we know glory and power that belongs to God uh, has been put on display, you know, with all of His judgment and all that. And the word salvation does not... The focus here now on justification or sanctification. You see, when we got saved, He justified us and He sanctified us. Amen? But salvation in this part of the Scripture, when it's talking about salvation here, it's talking about us forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever being with Jesus forever, forever, forevermore because of salvation. That's what it's talking about. That we're going to be in His presence forevermore. Nothing will ever take us out of His presence. Nothing will ever take us away from Him. Amen? 
We're going to be with Him forevermore. And it's, it's focusing not on sanctification or justification here. It's focusing on our salvation and what our salvation has brought us through Jesus Christ. It's the glorification of His kingdom. It's a glorification of His saints here. We're, we're, we're hallelujah and we're amen in Him because of what He's given us. In other words, we just get so happy, we just can't contain ourselves. We're just praising Him and worshiping Him. And by the way, folks, if you don't like people that praise the Lord and raise their hands sometimes, you better not go to heaven. Because one of these days, we're just going to praise Him. And worship Him. We're, we're going to know, and I'm not saying that. I wish I could get it out like it's supposed to be. What I'm trying to tell you, we're going to just enjoy our salvation by knowing that we're in the presence of God forevermore. It's not about justification there or sanctification there. It's about what salvation has brought to us there. Hallelujah. To celebrate the glorification of the saints in the kingdom of God. The second thing, I've got to hurry right here. Heaven rejoices because justice, justice has run its course. Look at verse 2. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Heaven's rejoicing, the second reason, is because of God's judgments. How many of you know God's judgments are, ju are, are true and righteous? They're true and righteous. When He judges, it's right. They're true. You can stick by it, stick to it. And in heaven, we're, we're praising Him because He's so righteous. The evidence we've already seen of the destructive power of the Lord Jesus Christ over the wicked Babylon. And throughout history, God's people have been dis, you know, uh, disturbed a lot of time of, about iniquity and injustice. And by the way, folks, Christian people ought to be disturbed about that. We ought to be disturbed tonight about the sin that goes on in this world. Amen? If we're not disturbed about that, there's something wrong with us. We need to get a checkup. But we ought to be disturbed about the sin. Does it disturb you when you see things that you know is not right? When you hear somebody say something that you... Does that disturb you? Because I'm telling you tonight, if you're saved, that ought to disturb you. Does it disturb you when somebody says something bad about the Lord? Takes His name in vain. Does that disturb you? Tells dirty jokes. Does that, that disturb you? Because there's something about a saved person. I'm going to quit right here before I get too much along. But there's something about a saved person. Listen, a saved person has the Holy Spirit in them. And when the Holy Spirit hears something that's not right, that's sin, it ought to disturb you. And if it doesn't, there's something wrong. And that's what God's talking about here. When we're in heaven one of these days, we're going to be hallelujah because we know that His judgments are right and His judgments are true. And we know that sin is wicked and wrong. And when He judges Babylon, we're going to say, Hallelujah, you're righteous. You said you were going to do it and you did it. Well, I tell you, heaven's going to be good, isn't it? Everything's going to be right with us. I can say that. Because when you get to heaven, everything's going to be right with you. You're no sinner no more when you get to heaven. Everybody with me? You're just like Jesus when you get to heaven. No sin. And I think sometimes we forget that. Boy, I can't wait to get to heaven, can you? And I know why I'm going. I'm not going to heaven because I'm preaching to you tonight. 
And I'm not going to heaven because I go to Grace Free Will Baptist Church. I think a lot of people think that their church gets them to heaven. They don't. I'm not going to heaven because my wife's a Christian. I'm going to heaven tonight because I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm saved. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for loving us the way that you do. And I know, Father, that, man, it gets so good sometimes you just can't get it out. And I just thank you for your word. I thank you for the book of Revelation. I thank you for your promises. I thank you that one day in heaven we'll, we will be enjoying this. We'll be going through this time and we'll think, I remember. I remember. Your word is true. Thank you, Lord. Now, you may be here tonight and you just need to come and just pray and ask the Lord to help you. Maybe you're praying for somebody at work that don't know Jesus. Well, we'll give you a little time to come and pray for them tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus. We'll give you time tonight to come. If you'll come right now, we're not going to linger, I promise. Lord Jesus, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what you've done for us. In your precious name, we thank you for everything that you've done. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. You're dismissed. See you Sunday.